the majority are still served on the common Correct. network. And um, so, so if you're so if you're investing uh, 800 million over six years, don't, 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 the math is going to be so it's about 133 million a year. But um, 133 point. I, I would say that, but, I would but, say that that should be put but, in the context, and just to be clear, that that investment. Um, should be put in the context of some of the financials that my colleague some laid out. Some of the financials that my colleague discussed at the outset of the presentation. <clears throat> Over that same 10-year period, Verizon lost, went from 12 million customers, 14 million in 2000, down to fewer than 3 million today. Um, at the same time, uh, over the past 10 years, uh, mm -hmm. our net income in the state has been negative 9.5 billion, resu resulting in a negative rate of return. Despite that, we've continued to invest over a billion dollars per year in the state, in our network. Um, so our commitment to New York is strong. Um, we've, we were only able to do that with the support of our parent company. Um, because obviously if we were standing alone on our New York intrastate operations, that wouldn't have been possible. Um, we are also doing other things uh, with our network and our products that will put us in a position to uh, deliver services to our customers going forward. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're building revenue streams and doing the type of things in the market that we need to do to be successful. Um, at the same time, we're, we, you know, we're hopeful that the commission and the legislature will uh, take some steps to uh, make it easier, particularly for regulated companies, to do business in New York um, and to reduce some of the burdens, as we described in our testimony filed with the commission, so that we can continue to innovate and continue to invest. Okay. So... In these areas of uh, New York State where the Verizon Fios product, you've, you've chosen not to uh, seek a franchise and not provide the service. Um, uh, why, why is that? Why are you not attempting to uh, compete uh, in those service territories? Um, well, if I could answer, answer that question in part, sure. and, 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 sure. and my colleague may be able to um, uh, add to anything that we, we may have missed. We obviously have re received requests from some municipal leaders to deploy our service uh, in their communities. I have personally responded to those leaders and what I'll say to you, Mr. Chairman, is what we have said uh, to some of those mayors uh, who, who I think in every case have uh, one of our competitors represented by someone at this table providing broadband service uh, and, and cable television service to them. We are focused, um, as my colleague said, on the more than 180 communities where we are deploying uh, this service, um, uh, making sure that our deployment is completed, um, that we can focus on providing service to those customers given the substantial investments that have already been made. Starting, you know, not least of which the city of New York, three billion, three and a half billion, uh, and counting. Um, decisions may be made uh, in the future with respect to other communities, but right now our focus is making sure that we are um, meeting our customers' needs with who already have uh, files available in in their communities. And right now, that's more than or close to 200 municipalities to date. And and that's our and that's our focus, given the substantial investments that have already been made. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll uh, just hold on a minute. I'll, I'll be finished, and then we'll, um, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, uh, other member, other members on the panel after other members would like to ask questions about to Verizon. Um, but uh, so your uh, your 10K, your report to your shareholders uh, <clears throat> references that the uh, the FiOS product has a whatever it's 30 to 35 percent penetration rate uh, where it's offered, um, meaning customers are taking it. Um, uh, is is the problem in New York that uh, within the franchise areas where you uh, are offering the service, you're not getting that level of customer take on the product? Um, I think in the in the the 10K, that's a national number that you're citing. Yeah, that's a national number. Yeah. Um, I, I I think the the answer is that we are rolling out 
um, in a significant portion of New York State, um, and that we are in the process of building out the areas that we've signed up um, to build out. And the truth of the matter is, we can't do everything everywhere at the same time. So the business made the decision a couple of years ago uh, to focus on and build out um, the, the areas that we've already signed up for. And, and obviously, New York City is a big, big thing that we signed up for that we're working with them to deploy. Um, you know, as we work through, we're, we're constantly, you know, rethinking our business plan in response to competitive situation. Um, but sitting here, that's, that's where we are today. And there's really nothing more to it than that we're focused on, on doing those things. Within New York City, where you uh, actually have provided the capacity mm -hmm. to offer the FIOS product, are you, I mean, obviously it's taking time, but do you believe you're going to get a 30 to 35 percent penetration rate in New York City where the product is available? What I would say is, I, I, I mean, well, I mean obviously, we're, obviously, well, I was going to say, obviously, we're sitting here with our competitors on either side, or, or at least to one side. 100%. Here's, here's, what I, here's what I would say. Um, we're obviously going to try to win as many customers as we can. We don't. We we think FiOS is a great product, and um, we think our customers think it's a great product too. When we can get it to them, so we're going to get it to as many people as we can, and hopefully we will we we'll win 30, 40, 50 percent of the market. That would be great. So, I mean, that's certainly our an objective is to get as many customers on our FiOS platform as we can. Um, and we're doing that partly by, you know, we're, we're at least providing customers, you know, in the situation where we're migrating customers to the fiber network, one benefit is they have the ability to purchase FiOS services. They don't have the obligation. They can maintain the basic services that they have when we migrate them. But those customers will now have the ability to purchase bio services if they choose to, and we're, we're marketing the service, and, and we, we hope to attract as many customers as we can. All right. Other members? It's Mr. Buckwell. Thank you. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you all for being here for, with your testimony today. My uh, uh, questions to the representatives from Verizon, I represent uh, uh, district in Westchester County, including a number of communities that would like to have uh, access to Verizon Bio service, but uh, <clears throat> do not. Um, uh, and as I understand the general history, there were very active discussions with those communities un until the time that the New York City franchise was agreed to. Uh, and as you uh, expressed, the, the focus of the company effectively shifted uh, to uh, addressing uh, uh, that large franchise. Um, my uh, first question is, um, what really are the constraints that are, are that keep Verizon from uh, being able to address potential new franchises in, in uh, new territory? Uh, to my mind, the two that are most possible are financial resources of the, of the company and manpower. Is there anything in addition to that that uh, should be that we should keep in mind as, we, as New York State sets policy in this area? Um, what I would I would suggest that um, well to be clear, it's a business decision um, that we focus in the manner that I've described. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was that that, that it makes sense to describe it as uh, a decision that necessarily reflects constraints. Um, it's a decision that the company has made in how it's going to allocate its resources at this time, um, and how it's going to go about providing its <coughs> services in the market. So, but let me get clarification because the state policy of the company is essentially it's not considering expansion to individual communities uh, and particularly when those are communities with which uh, Verizon had 
extended conversations at one point, and therefore at one point certainly had the view that it was potentially uh, uh, quite profitable to enter a particular uh, uh, local market. And I think it, it might, might well, although you're, you're, if, if you disagree, please let me know, it might well be safe to assume that there is at least some community in New York State that Verizon does not currently provide services to, to which it would be profitable in isolation for uh, the, the company to provide uh, services. So given that, it seems to me that for a company to um, decide not to enter a, a profitable market um, mm -hmm. inherently means the company operates under certain constraints. And we all operate under certain constraints. We all have budgets and limited time and, and so forth. But, uh, but have I, am I inaccurate in my general framing of the, of the situation that faces the company? To be responsive to it, I, what I would, obviously the business faces constraints in terms of, um, you know, we, we do have limited resources, as difficult as I think it is for some to say with respect to Verizon given our size. <clears throat> um, I, I think it's really just a question of where the business um, decides to focus its resources at a given time, what its business strategy is, how it intends to win in the competitive market and to provide its customers with the services you know, at the quality that they want and, and the range of services that the customers want. Um, you know, you can overextend yourself and fail to provide quality services to your customers. We're not going <coughs> to do that. We've decided, we made a business decision that this is how we can best serve our customers. Um, so to your point, are there constraints? Every business has constraints. Um, we believe we have sufficient force to deliver service to our customers in New York State um, and that we've deployed sufficient financial resources to deliver on the commitments we've made. So, so let me ask, in those markets like the ones we're talking about outside of New York City uh, where there's an incumbent provider uh, and uh, Verizon doesn't currently provide uh, its file service, do you as a company have uh, <coughs> specific recommendations to things New York State should be doing, either from a legislative or regulatory perspective, to encourage competition in those sorts of markets? Well, well a couple things. One is um, there are things that are underway already uh, that I believe address, at least in part, uh, your question. The governor's $500 million broadband program I think is a perfect example. There is no program like that of that magnitude, uh, that size, in any other state in the nation. Uh, there's not even a close second. Uh, and so uh, our company has not made a decision yet as to whether we participate in that program. Some of the de details were just recently unveiled uh, by uh, the, the Cuomo administration. Um, we're taking a look at it. We haven't made a decision, but whether we as a company <coughs> participate or not, it is a program that at least in terms of outline form, I believe is structured in such a way, I mean, we'll have to see what the details look like, that you know, many, of, uh, many providers who may not currently be providing service in an area um, are expected to participate in the program and, and provide service. Uh, and so I do think that there are a number of things that you as policy leaders can do to encourage writ large innovation and investment. I spoke to that as a general matter in my opening remarks, starting with updating the telecommunications laws that date, some, in some cases, 30, 40, 60, 70, approaching 100 years old. And that's not an exaggeration. So as a general matter, um, you know, we're going to invest <coughs> We're going to do what we need to do to meet our customers' needs. And I've spoken, I think, with some specificity, as, as, as my colleague has, about the extraordinary and unmatched level of our investment. But yes, would it be easier for us to invest even more and innovate even more in this state if we had a framework that wasn't going back to the mid 19th or 20th century, yes, that would be helpful. But I do believe that there are some programs uh, that are being put into place right now, starting with the governor's broadband program, that I think you know will play a significant role in 
uh, deploying uh, broadband in those very, very, very limited areas uh, where neither Verizon or um, our, con our competitors uh, are currently um, in play. So, Ms. Even and Ms. Chairman, this will be my uh, final question. Thank you for the time. Um, with regards to the governor's uh, proposed broadband investment, again, I'd like to focus the question on those communities that have one provider, but not a second, and Verizon uh, uh, certainly a, often a possibility to be the second provider. We have, as, is, as the testimony is laid out uh, uh, today, but we certainly uh, knew we can before today, we have a few different situations in New York City. We have some places that don't have any broadband provider. We have uh, some places, uh, like the uh, uh, Chairman Brennan pointed out, um, have two broadband providers, and there's still a question of, is that the appropriate policy goal? Should the goal, in fact, be uh, more given general uh, antitrust uh, monopolistic concerns? Um, but then we also, in particular, have communities that have one provider uh, and not a second. Do you have an understanding in your review of the governor's proposal as to is the governor's proposal in terms of investment in broadband aimed at just one kind of community, say the community that doesn't currently have any broadband provider? Is it, is it uh, accessible to companies for investing to become the second provider or potentially th third uh, provider? What's your general understanding of what the governor has proposed? Well, you know, let me say at the outset, um, and if, if for those of you who had a chance to review some of the information that was um, uh, recently um, made public by uh, the governor's office about the program, we're still reviewing it. Uh, there was a, um, a request for information uh, in terms of how best the program should be uh, <coughs> Uh, governed and what should be the rules and regulations that were governing it, that should govern it. Very proud to say uh, that the uh, association headed up by our colleague Bob Puckett submitted their very, very thoughtful uh, comments um, in response to that request for information. Now there's an RFP, which we and I'm sure many of our uh, competitors are reviewing now. It's about a week old. Uh, and I think there's going to be more information unveiled. I will say, however, you know, as a, as a former chief economic development advisor to this governor, um, I'm extraordinarily proud of the program from a personal and professional standpoint. Um, and as I said, there is no program like it anywhere uh, in the country. Um, we are still taking a look at some of the details um, as they're going to be rolled out. Um, Bob can probably better answer the question in terms of the array of providers that may decide to participate in the program, but um, I believe that the way it's constructed, it provides flexibility for providers, both large and small, particularly for some of the smaller members that, that Bob's uh, organization represents to participate and provide broadband uh, access in the very, very, very small areas. Again, the commission said the vast majority of New Yorkers have access to broadband, very small pockets that don't, and many of his members, um, you know, may be uh, looking at that program very closely and, and considering it in terms of provo providing broadband service in their areas. Yes, and in fact, some of the members will be applying for funds to provide broadband in other er members' areas. Uh, but to your question, Assemblyman, the program is designed to go after unserved areas of the state, which is defined as anywhere with less than 25 megabit per second, or underserved areas, anything less than the state goal of 100 megabits per second. What they're doing in the first round of the program is they're excluding any areas that Time Warner is currently serving until it is better understood where is Time Warner going to build out to the 145,000 <laughs> homes as ordered by the PSC and the charter merger uh, proceeding. So that's how the program is working. My understanding is the program isn't designed necessarily, if you have a provider in a community already providing 100 megabyte service, the grant program is not I do not believe going to fund a second provider from coming into that community to then compete with, with the first provider. And that's actually consistent with uh, 
even the, the federal program that provided similar funds. The concern is that you don't want to subsidize a competitor in an area where a company's already made investment decision and is rolling out the service um, so that you don't discourage that type of investment going forward. So it's a delicate balance that they're trying to strike. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Corwin. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Um, just by disclosure, I should put out there that for 26 years, my family competed against Verizon uh, in the telephone book business, the telephone directories, the big yellow things with ads in them. Um, and it was interesting because my experience was, uh, at the time, Verizon was uh, a phone company, landline, copper, deliverer of service. Um, I competed against them, or my company competed against them. Uh, in the telephone directory business, which was not a regulated business. So it was very interesting. I felt like I had the inside perspective on what it was like to be in a monopoly, um, but also what it was like to compete against a very large, very successful company that got a lot of benefit from the monopoly side of the business into their non-regulated business. That was over. It's over with. We've since sold the company. Um, but I do agree with what all of you have just said in terms of going forward, competition is what makes the difference. I know when we were competing against Verizon, we were a better phone directory because of the competition against Verizon, and I think it goes both ways. But listening to what you all have to say, I, I do see some concerns as far as the lack of competition, uh, both at the larger level when you're talking about going into municipalities and having to negotiate with each municipality in a franchise area, but also on a more micro level when you're talking about going into a building and you're, you're not able to have access into the building to provide for those customers. So I guess my point here is that in our attempts to level the playing field, and I'm assuming allow more competitors into the, the franchise space and having everyone treated equally so it is a level playing field, um, what should we be doing to make sure that we address the accessibility aspects of competition? What should be done to make sure that you can, uh, you know, negotiate and get the franchise agreement in a more simplified process? Or what should we be looking at in terms of regulations for allowing you to get into the building to be able to provide the infrastructure, to be able to provide the service to all the customers? And I'll kind of bring that to all of you out there. I'm looking at Verizon, but certainly I'd welcome comments from all of you. Um, uh, with respect to the building access issues, um, you know, to some extent, it would be great if we could go back in time. Um, I think one of the biggest factors that has impacted our ability to get into those buildings is the fact that New York, like many states, have statutes that say you can't get a prescriptive easement um, if you're a utility. Um, and back when we were a regulated entity, um, despite the fact that we've had facilities there for a really long time, we can't we, we weren't able to, to buy any access as a product of the passage of time. Um, were that the case, we would be able to get access. We would have a right to access. Um, you know, we, we, are, we are working to, to try and come up with, uh, you know, a way that we would be able to get access to those buildings. I, I, I don't have a, an answer for you. Um, that would, would really directly address that. We're gonna to continue to use the tools that are available to us, um, but we're gonna reserve the ability to come back and talk to you <coughs> and others uh, if we manage to come up with a solution to the building access issue. And just to, to add to that briefly, and I, I know my, my um, peers will have you know, some comments on this as well. It's not necessarily a legislative solution in terms of what I'm about to say. What, what we're trying to do, uh, and we try very hard with many municipal leaders, uh, particularly most significantly now with the city of New York, just given the magnitude of that project, education is key. Yeah, education is key. I mean, a lot of building owners, we get, they've got a lot of things to worry about in terms of managing their buildings, everything else that's going on. And we're knocking on the door saying, please let us in. If you got a tenant, we want to get them files, they want files, right? So. Part, you know, we have begun work, you know, our business <coughs> colleagues have, have been engaging pretty extensively and we're ratcheting up those efforts significantly with the various real estate associations in the city of New York and in other uh, large cities where this challenge exists, although obviously to a lesser extent. And we've made some progress in that respect. Um, 
Every time that we need to uh, enter into a major agreement to get in a building, a lot of times there's, and I say this as a lawyer, but with, you know, with respect to my lawyer colleagues, a lot of back and forth with the building owner. I mean, it's paper and paper back and forth. So one of the things that we're discussing uh, with some of the real estate associations in New York City is having one simplified form, right? that any of us can use um, as we're negotiating with the building and, and seeking access. So not a legislative solution, but I did want you to know, uh, Assemblywoman, that uh, we're trying to use lots of different creative <coughs> tools because um, there, you know, there's nobody who wants to get to our prospective customers more quickly than we do. And mm -hmm. so we're trying to be as creative as we can to address those issues. Okay, thank you. One thing I'd like to mention is you emphasize the importance of competition and the benefit to consumers of that, and we wholeheartedly agree. And as a traditional wireline phone provider, we would encourage that like services be regulated in a like manner. And we face uh, regulation of our wireline voice offering that, frankly, our competitors who are offering a, a, a voice over IP offering they don't face the same regulation. So that's one of the areas of updating the, the telecommunications laws and regulations. Um, that would be a great benefit in the marketplace. Okay, sure, absolutely. Uh, just one other question, um, Verizon, you made a comment regarding the operating loss that you are experiencing in New York State. I'm assuming, because you're a profitable company, that you have profitable operations in other states. What would you say would be the biggest difference between what's happening here in New York versus your operations in other states? What are the, the, the target areas that you would like to see change that would help you to become more profitable here? Um, I mean, I, it, I, I don't think it's any mystery. New York's a high cost state in which to operate. Um, I, I think the best, the best thing that could be done would be to, uh, as we've been discussing before, uh, streamline the regulatory process and um, do whatever you can to send a signal that, you know, I think as our motto says, New York's open for business and that um, they will support innovation and the, the types of tough business decisions that companies have to make and at the same time that, that we, can, we can work cooperatively and, and solve problems that exist that, that make it easier for us to do the type of things that we want to do and that we think customers in the state want. Right. And just one other quick question, and I'll put this out to all of you. Uh, in terms of net neutrality, uh, what has been, or do you have impressions or any conclusions you can draw in terms of changes in terms of traffic flow? It seems to me, and this is anecdotally, that since we've had the, the net neutrality rule, that um, it's becoming harder and it's slower uh, when you're on a Sunday night when you want to go on the computer, on the internet. Uh, is that attributable to the, the decisions regarding net neutrality, or is, or is that more having to do with technology? I mean, I, from Verizon's perspective, we've always supported uh, net neutrality. Um, uh, there's been no change with respect to our company uh, in light of the decisions at the FCC, except that we comply with the law, and, uh, but, but we've always been supportive of net neutrality, and we continue to be. Mm -hmm. I would reiterate that the decision didn't really change our practices as a company standpoint. I think what you may be experiencing is just the uh, continued and exponential growth of broadband usage throughout the, you know, throughout the market. And you could be experiencing situations even beyond the control of the provider that's serving you. <coughs> if you try to go to Amazon two days <coughs> before Christmas to order something, you know, sure. they may be getting a little more traffic than they can handle. And, of course, you're experiencing that slowdown. There's a lot of providers in the chain, so I think short answer to your question, it's a technical issue more than the impacts of net neutrality. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Moya. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question to Mr. Uh, Clemens. You had said earlier in your uh, statement that uh, it didn't make sense to build out 100 percent of New York because of economic and demographic reasons. When you say demographics, what do you mean by that? Um, when I say, I mean concentration of people per square mile. Okay. Density. I just, density. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Mr. Scheminger? I, this is a Verizon. I'm sorry. This is another Verizon question. But then I do have a question for Cable Telecom <laughs> and for Frontier. Uh, 
I was chatting with a gentleman uh, who opined that there were two states. Each state had a 50-50 matching grant program, big money. One state was a high-cost state, the other state wasn't. Where would I choose to spend my match? And his answer was, or his or her answer was, obviously in the state with the lower cost. So my question to Verizon is, do you feel that New York high cost factors will deter your company or others from participating in the new New York broadband grant program? Well, my, you know, Keith may have some additional thoughts, but if I, I may, and good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, good afternoon, yes. My fellow Western, fellow Western New Yorker. Um, <clears throat> The, I guess let me just emphasize at the outset um, that Verizon is in a special, unique situation because despite the fact that, that New York is historically a higher cost state, it has gotten much better under the leadership of this governor. Um, but whether it's property taxes or labor costs, bottom line is it's a higher cost state. Nevertheless, our commitment is unparalleled, unmatched, <coughs> and extraordinary. Um, as reflected in our 21,000 employees, the 31,000 retirees, and the billions, the tens of billions that we have invested over the years. So the, the only um, uh, amendment I would make to your suggestion is that I say this as a very proud New Yorker that is proud to work for a company that could have been headquartered in any of the 50 states, but chose to continue to be headquartered in here. Um, and to, chose to remain here to continue to vest despite the multi-billions in dollars and losses over the course of uh, the decade. That being said, yes, you know, it's basic economics. If you're getting equal things from equal places, uh, you know, two places, but one place you have to spend money, less money than the other place, economics, um, if that were your sole driving force, would almost dictate you would go to the other states. But our commitment is so extraordinary and I think so unique that you know we have worked with the state. Um, we have we proudly have you know many many customers across our business, both wireline and wireless in the state. You know, we've got more employees <coughs> in the state than any other in the country. And so, uh, short answer to your question is yes. Basic economics, you're obviously going to a state that's less uh, expensive in terms of cost of doing business is going to be more attractive. Um, uh, that, nef that typically doesn't have New York State in that category, but because of our commitment, we're here, we're committed like no one else is, and we will be today uh, and moving forward. 